Hello and welcome to Made for More. I am your host, Holly J. Moore. This is where we chat about anything and everything that's going to help you show up as a better version of yourself than you showed up yesterday. Because we don't want you just to survive in your life, we want you to thrive. Today and every day, I am joined by my podcast producer, Aaron Bender. Very good morning, Holly. How are you? Good morning. Doing I say well. good morning. I don't know where people are watching this. It true. could be the middle of the night, but that either way. How are things? Things are amazing. How are things with you? Not bad. Not bad. I know good. this is our special Valentine's Day episode. It is. Do you have any Valentine's Day plans? Um, y- yes. Okay. Yes, I totally plan everything, <laughs> every time. Of course you yes, do. Way yes, way in advance. Yes. No, I... Uh, <clears throat> Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes. Okay. What do you recommend? Like what, 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 um, <laughs> what's a surefire get out of, get out of jail free <laughs> Valentine's day gift? Well, here's the deal. So by the time everybody is hearing this, I will be on a jet plane on my way to basically the furthest place away I can get from my lava <laughs> drinking champagne by myself. What? Why? How? <laughs> Well, because my husband is the most amazing husband. Like, he should teach husband classes. He is the most amazing husband 364 days out of the year. I'm taking notes. But you know what he is on Valentine's Day? Hmm. Total dick. Like, (laughs) supreme dick. And so, you know, we've been married for 20 years. We laugh about it now. But I'm like... Yeah, I mean, it's all about expectations, right? In the early years, I was like, if he treats me this good, I mean, he treats me like an absolute queen 364 days of the year. And I'm thinking, if this is this good on all these other 364 days of the year, like Valentine's Day, I am going to wake up in a sea of rose petals. There's going to be diamonds like falling from the heavens. I mean, this is the expectation, right? Like if he's amazing on on all the other days, like why would Valentine's Day not be like a step up from that? Oh, no, no. He goes the other way. Total dick. So, uh, (laughs) yeah. So I am really not the person to consult on, you know, how to do a proper romantic and Valentine's apparently neither Day. is Jeff. <laughs> right, yeah. and neither is yeah. Jeff. Yes, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't ask him. Yeah, oh, we were actually talking about it, and, you know, again, because now we just laugh about it. And truth be told, I have a business meeting, but it's like a twofer. A twofer. Yeah. I have a business meeting, plus I get to be way far away. Yeah. Um, but I'm like, what is it? What happened? Like, are you just, like, rebelling against the man? Like, why, why, you know, be a dick on Valentine's Day? And he reminded me, Mm. our first Valentine's Day, I had the brilliant idea to go to Disneyland. And as we are waiting in line, trying to enter the park, you know, so this is like probably 9 a.m., he tells me, the two things I hate most in life are waiting in lines and large crowds. (laughs) I'm like, oh, man, (laughs) this is not going to be good. So So no more Disneyland on Valentine's Day or, yes. No more anything on Valentine's Day. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) But the other 364 days of the year are utterly amazing. So, Speaking of utterly amazing, yes. our guest, Lily Shepard. Oh, yes, Lily. Wait. Yes. Are you ready? I, I mean, it could get a little racy, a little sexy. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to leave my, my camera on over here so people <laughs> can, the people can see me blush. Yes, because yes. Because I, I know we're going to be talking about feminine movement. We are, And yes. uh, recapturing Sexuality. Yes, yes, a little uh, bit. A little, <laughs> little bit. Yes. No. Still a family friendly show. So, yes. you know, stay tuned. No need to turn turn <laughs> off right now. No need to tune out. No disclaimers here. We're right, fine. right. Still family friendly, but so important for women out there. Like I'm super excited to talk to Lily because I'm super fascinated by her work. It's gonna be really good. Today, we are here with an utterly amazing guest, Lily Shepard. She is an author, embodiment coach, and dance educator, and the founder of Lily Shepard Moves. Hi, Lily. How are you? I am so well and so excited to be here. Good. I am so excited to have you. As you know, I've been fascinated with your work um, really since I heard about you, maybe about a year or so um, ago. So let's just jump right in. Like, tell us what is your work? What do you do? 
So I help women connect back to their bodies and explore what it would be like to invite pleasure into their lives. Uh, women that are high achieving, high earning, professional women usually sacrifice some bit of that piece of their lives in order to get where they are. So I come in and give them some practice and give them some guidance around how to reconnect with their bodies and, and pleasure in their lives. Okay. Um, so now everybody can see why I find this so fascinating. Um, how I have, a, I have a lot of questions. I want to unpack a lot of things you just said, but kind of, how did you even start down this path of doing this type of work? Well, I have a background in dance. I've been a dancer for all of my life. Uh, I studied at the university level, then moved to Las Vegas, where I was a performer. I was an exotic dancer. Uh, I was a dance mentor to adults and children with physical and intellectual disabilities. So there was a point in time in my life where movement, there was an intersection of all of these different arenas in which I was moving through. And that really allowed me to see what a powerful tool movement is. And so after I went through a horrible divorce um, during my time in Las Vegas, and it was during that time that I started to really understand movement as healing. Uh, it just seemed like a perfect storm. I was involved in all of these different arenas where there was stage, there was sexy club movement, there was um, movement guidance, there was stage performance movement. And in my own personal life, I was struggling. And I had only known movement from a performance perspective as a dancer. And I, I got a message, a download, whatever you want to call it, but something was like, just move. And it, it didn't say just dance, right? I think that's an important distinction Okay. because I only knew movement as dance and as a performance. And during that time going through my divorce, I really started to explore movement as a form of healing. And that's what led me to develop uh, the programs that I have today and, and write the book and all of that. Yeah. So speaking of your book, this is the book pleasure principles for driven women. And this book is tiny, but mighty. I've read it twice. And as you can see, it's like, you know, I marked this book up. Like I was studying for like a history exam or something. I've got highlights. I've got notes, but I, I recall, um, at the beginning of the book, you talk about, you know, you were doing this exotic dancing in Vegas at the highest end clubs and you had been a dancer all your life. And I think you say in the book how you, even though you were able to move your body in a way that was, you know, looked pleasing to others, to men, to whatever, like that really wasn't the thing. Like at that time you sort of felt disconnected from your body. Is that right? That's absolutely right. And I think that speaks to women how we're socialized to just be performative. You know, this yeah. is an extreme level of, okay, I'm in a strip club and my job is to look sexy and enticing and inviting. And I felt absolutely none of those things at the time. But I think that a lot of us go through life in performance mode and really we are not feeling inside what it is that we are attempting to portray outwardly. So that was a, a wake up call for me because I thought, wow, if I could be doing this and making a, and clearly I'm doing it well, right? Money's <laughs> yeah. raining down. Dollar, you know, dollar bill. Doing, <laughs> yes, it's, it's raining. And, but how could I be doing this and doing it at a high level and feel so empty? Right. Yeah. So one of this, one of the passage or the excerpts from your book um, that I just, I want to read because I think it's so relatable and also so tragic. Um, it says there's no harder pill to swallow than realizing you've built a life, not based on what you truly desire, but on social conditioning, religious indoctrination, mommy culture, and capitalism. And I think this is sort of what you're talking about, right? It's like, we, it's a performance-based thing. Like we do, we live the life that we think we're supposed to live, that we think other people want us to live or that some sort of rule or religion or whatever has, has prescribed for us. But it sounds like 
you had experiences in your life, maybe your divorce, maybe other things compounding on that as well, that sort of like, it was almost like a breakthrough for you. Is that accurate to say? Absolutely. Just the understanding that I have a choice. I can choose to do things differently. It sounds so simple, but it's so profound because a lot of us do follow this prescribed path. I did the things I, okay, I went to college, I graduated, I moved, I started working in the industry in which I studied, I found a man, he was nice, I married him, I got pregnant, (laughs) we bought a house, we had a baby, all of these things, and I, I was on the path. And then it came tumbling down. And I realized, is this ever what I really wanted in the first place? Why? So your book is written for driven woman specifically. What is it about driven woman that made you, what is unique about them that made you want to actually speak to them or to us, I should say? <laughs> yeah. Right. Because I, I, I'm speaking to myself, you know, Absolutely, <laughs> I'm yes. speaking to myself and, and knowing that there are other women in the same boat because driven women are ambitious yes. and, and go getting and go out and grab life rather than wait for it to happen to us. And so there was a dissonance between, wait, I feel so, I'm a mover. You know, I feel so great. I I wanna take what I want out of life, but also I'm not even really sure what I want out of life. And how can I resolve that? And so I think that driven women in particular have an inner motivation that, other women may not have why we are driven to, to get to where we want to go. So I just started thinking about what if we applied that same drive to understanding ourselves and really uncovering what it is that we really desire for our lives. So I know you mentioned you, you had gone through a divorce and this maybe was sort of the impetus for seeing movement as like a healing mechanism. How did you start like in a practical sense? What did you start doing? Well, and I talk about this in the book. I, I got this spirited feeling to just move and I put on music and my room was dark and I just, allowed myself to move in whatever way came through me. I did several different things. I was rolling around on the floor at one point. I was up and I was twerking at one point. I was doing African dance. I was breathing. I was just heaving almost at some point. And it was so cathartic. And I wasn't doing any steps or doing any TikTok dances or doing (laughs) anything that I had ever seen before. I was just open to what was taking place. And I had never felt that sense of release before. I, I cried. I laughed. I remember just laying on the floor in my room after moving and realizing like almost an hour had passed and so much had moved through. I I can't describe it. I felt almost weightless. You mentioned, you know, your background in dance. You you've danced with Beyonce. You've been an exotic dancer, all this doc, all this background in dance. Um, But you talk about in your book, sort of the connection between, um, well, I think in your book, it's actually the connection between pleasure and confidence. So, but when you were doing all that dancing and, you know, you were doing it very well, like, Did you feel like you had issues with confidence or what was going on with you at that time? I got confidence from being able to do things well. I was a great dancer. I was a great performance, performing artist. But the confidence I have now comes from knowing exactly who I am. Mm -hmm. And that's completely different Mm -hmm. from the confidence that I got for being great at what I did, uh, for being a great teacher, being a great dancer, being a great friend, you know, all of these external things. Now my confidence comes from knowing exactly who I am in this world. I think when, when I hear the word pleasure, maybe it's just because I have a dirty mind, but I automatically think sexual pleasure. Right. But I think you, you mentioned in your book, like pleasure comes in so many forms. It's, 
you know, my husband always makes fun of me because it's like the first sip of coffee is so good. And I take that first sip in the morning and it's like, oh, this is so good. It brings me so much joy. So I think you talk about in your book, like it's not just sexual pleasure. It's pleasure in so many different ways. It's all the things that you find joy in, right? Yes. And to your point, I had reservation about even naming the book Pleasure Principles because I was okay. thinking, oh, people are going to think I'm going to talk about <laughs> sex and all of this other stuff. And sex is great. And I do talk about it a little bit in the book. However, the awareness of what actually brings you joy and clients that I work closely with, I have them do an exercise in which they write out all of the small joys and pleasures. And yeah. sometimes it is that small sip of coffee or it's a favorite blanket or it's a piece of music or yeah, there, there, there are so many things, but the, the disheartening part about that, Holly, is that more often than not, they don't know where to start. I've never thought about it. I've yeah. never thought about, no one's ever asked me. I've never thought about the, the, the things that make me happy on a day-to-day -day basis. Tell us more about like this moving with feminine intention. What does that even mean? How do you know if you're doing that? Like unpack that for us. It is quite simple and men can do it too, because we both have a balance of masculine and feminine energy. Yes. So I want to make it clear that this practice is not just for women, but it involves three different elements. And the first of those is exploration. We're moving to explore, not to do any particular thing, which is, is different from how a lot of people approach movement um, as exercise, a certain number of reps, or we're going to run a certain distance, or we're going to do these certain yoga poses moving with feminine intention and the beginning to explore just means that you're in observance of what's happening. There's, there's nothing to actually do. You might notice, Oh, when I roll my head like this, Oh, it makes a lot of sounds. Maybe I should roll my head like that when I get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> no, it's just about <laughs> observing yourself. Uh, and so the second element is sensation. And that is, how do you perceive through your senses when you're moving? Is there a certain part of your body that you tend to gravitate towards? Um, what aromas are you smelling while you're moving? Like the whole sensory experience. Okay. Where do your eyes tend to land? Do you like to move to music? Do you like to move to silence? Just getting curious about those things. And the third element is flow. And that is letting movement unfold versus doing predetermined steps. Okay. Just letting the movement unfold. I'm doing this and then I'm doing that and then I'm doing this and then I'm doing that and not having it to look a certain way. Okay. And you will feel crazy. Let me say that. <laughs> if you are not used to moving in this way, you, you will <laughs> likely feel crazy and you will okay. feel like you look silly. And yeah. those are things to be expected, but I just want to encourage anyone listening, just give it a try. You know, no one's recording you. We're not putting you on the internet yeah. or anything. Right. This is completely for you and for you to develop a practice that feels good. So if you can just push past those initial moments of, oh gosh, I look ridiculous. <laughs> I promise you, you, you'll find something on the other side. Okay. So I think you said it's so simple, but you didn't say it was easy, right? Because I, I'm just thinking of myself right now. My day starts at 5 a.m. And it is like the second my feet hit the floor beside my bed, it is scheduled. It is regimented. It feels like a sprint until basically when I get home at nine o'clock at night. So hearing you talk about doing these things and, you know, like observing, I'm thinking in my head, oh my gosh, take you mean to tell me I should take 30 seconds and like observe like that to me seems that seems hard, you know, like so when in your work with women, um, have you found it to be challenging where it's like you really need to be like, no, just take a moment. It's worth it. Like, is it hard for, for them to to sort of adopt this practice? 
Yes, absolutely. Because like you said, there's a schedule and I have things to do. And what is all this exploration going to get me? It's hard to see a tangible result, right? Yes. When you're yes. a woman in business in particular, it's like, okay, what is the ROI on this? What, yes. what am I getting What are the here? KPIs? What's the ROI? What's the result? What's the goal? Right, right. Yes. And so it's a different way of thinking. Oh, but I found that, I mean, I do a practice in the morning that's six minutes. Okay. And it really does not take long, but what it does is one, it reinforces the message that I am the most important person mm -hmm. and that I need some time that is not scheduled before I meet the world and whatever that looks like, I need to meet myself. Yeah. And so those six minutes allow me to do that. And yes. beyond that, it also cultivates the ability to be present in the rest of my day. Yes. Because often if, as soon as your feet hit the ground, you're moving from thing to thing to thing and the world is pulling you in a bunch of different directions, you don't ever fully arrive anywhere. Right. Yes. Because you're, there's always a next thing. Yes. And so yeah. it just, it, it is a beautiful practice because you will find that your interactions are different when you are fully present and when you've given yourself that time as a gift and when you've established that your time is important, it, it, it's decreased resentment for sure. I don't wow. know about you, but sometimes I feel very resentful when I'm just in service to my calendar and everyone has yes. demands on my time and there's nothing left for me. And so just that little six minutes really helps to mitigate that. Yes, that's so, I mean, I've never really thought about it in those terms. Like I've never thought about it as resentment, but oh my gosh, so many times I, I will wake up thinking, okay, I know I have, you know, a 30 minute window here and I'll check my calendar because of course I live and die by my calendar and someone has put something in those 30 minutes and it's like, oh, you know, now I don't have that 30 minute window. Now I, you know, I mean, my assistant's like, okay, when are you going to go to the bathroom during the day? I'm like, yeah, there is no time for that. So I, that is so true that it, it does sort of create this sense of resentment. And I love what you said before I meet the world, I have to meet myself. Like, oh my gosh, I love it. That's so such words to live by for sure. Um, so one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk to you is because, you know, I'm a divorce lawyer, as you know, and our, our firm is niched down to representing business owners and professionals, which statistically happens to be more men. So I've represented probably more men than women as a divorce lawyer. And I just know through my almost 20 years of doing that, I would say like, the most common sort of complaint that I hear from the men that are now embarking on a divorce is they were unhappy or unsatisfied with the physical intimacy, with the sex life. And I am always shocked at how many sexless marriages there are out there. So, but I mean, I'm almost ashamed to say it at this point until I read your book and until we spoke, I really kind of put that, I don't know. I kind of was like, okay, wives, like step it up. You got to step up your game here. Never really going deeper into maybe what is causing that. Why is this an issue? So what would you say to that issue? What would you tell the women they should be doing? Maybe, you know, is there something the men can do? Like, can you speak to that? I think for women, it's important like that six minutes, right? Yeah. Taking time for self because then otherwise sex becomes another demand on you, right. another demand of time, of your body, of, you know, and if you don't feel that you've given yourself anything, it is hard to show up for a partner in that way. Yeah. As far as men, yeah. wash a dish or something. <laughs> wash a dish, you know, wash a dish, um, do some yard work. There's yeah. actually a study uh, in the sexual research journal that set that, highlights the correlation between domestic duties and women's uh, libido and desire. Oh. And what they found was that when men take up more of that and not just chores, right? But yeah. as women, we're often responsible. We have such a, 
a load as far as not only working outside of the home, definitely with the children, right. um, but knowing things. Knowing yeah. when when appointments are, knowing when birthdays are, being able to send gifts when someone got married, all of these things that we keep track of that we're responsible for. And you don't want to be having sex when you have so much up there and yes. you're responsible for so much. So a beautiful act is when a, when a partner can take some of that off of your plate. Right. And what the study found was that I, I, I'm joking about wash a dish, but it helped. Joking, Women but were, not joking. Yeah, joking, but not yeah. joking. So I would say lightening the load. Yeah. And then a woman can start to remember because she, her mind isn't boggled with who has to go to practice and what's for dinner and when are the cleaning right. people coming and when do we send your mother-in-law a gift and yeah. all of these things. Yeah. Then she can remember, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm sexy. You know, <laughs> right. and I want I want to remember. I want to it's an I want to tap back into that part of who I am, but when there's so many things layered on top of that, it gets yeah. hard. Yeah, the mental load. Yeah, absolutely. Um one of the things that you said when we were talking though that I do think is important and helpful to women is you mentioned like yes, men can wash a dish. They can take some of that mental and physical load off. But ultimately, the responsibility is with women, right? Yes, because yeah. your sexuality is yours. Right. And it doesn't only exist in relation to a partner. Yeah. And it took me some time to understand that. I always thought of sex as something that, as a demonstration mm -hmm. of, of love, of commitment, of something to a partner but once I began to take ownership of my sexuality and and start to become curious about what that meant and, and how I wanted to feel in my own body and what made me feel sexy and what I found to be enticing and what put me in a sensual mood, then I started to understand, wait a minute, this is a whole thing that exists for me and I choose to share it. Right. You know, yeah. with my husband is something that we share in, but it belongs to me. And yeah. so ultimately it's, it's my job to tend to that part of my being. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's true. And I think a lot of times maybe, you know, we, we use as a scapegoat, like maybe we haven't realized that fully that it is, it is within ourself and it's for us and it is our own. And then we share it, like you said, um, so maybe the first part of it, you know, or maybe there's a, a sector of people out there that like haven't realized that yet, but I think maybe there's another sector out there that it's like, maybe it's an excuse, you know, to say like, oh, you know, put it kind of put it on the other person. So I, I think the concept, I mean, I, I kind of try to live my life with like a hundred percent personal responsibility. So that's probably why this resonates with me, but like the concept that like, no, we are actually responsible for it ourselves and we are responsible for our own sexuality and what brings us joy and pleasure and all that ourselves. Um, and then we can share that. You know, I, I love that. I think that's really helpful. Yeah. No one tells us that, Holly. I mean, Nobody think about does. it. Well, Lily, you're we telling people now. <laughs> Thank True God. Indeed. True indeed. You know, think about it. Like, well, they took my virginity True. or I gave it up. Or all of these phrases that are in our lexicon that that just reinforce that right. that thought that it is just something to be given or taken and it's never really ours. I firmly believe that like every day is a chance to show up as a better version of yourself than the day before. But also part of my story, part of the mission of my firm is like sort of embracing those really dark times because that's where you are literally made. Like that's what creates shapes and molds your character, your person, your soul, you know? So I do think there is such value in those dark times. And if we're always sort of covering them up, not sharing them, not communicating them, not really getting in touch with them, then we sort of lose the value of like that sort of next phase that is bright and shiny and amazing, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And be yeah. the friend that asks, how are you? And really give space for someone to give an honest answer. Yeah. We yeah. always go through life. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, girl. I'm fine. Right. I'm good. 
yeah. and we give these short little blips and we need to start being okay with saying, oh, this isn't the best day or, oh, I, I'm feeling a little heavy right now or just creating space where people feel safe and comfortable enough to share mm -hmm. what's really going on with them to the degree that they want to. Lily, this has been such a pleasure. You ha you gave me like several aha moments today. Um, so, okay, your book is Pleasure Principles for Driven Women, but you all, more than just writing this book, you also do other things. Tell us if somebody wants to learn more about your work, buy your book, work with you personally, like how should they reach out to you? Where should they go? Well, everything is on my website, lilysheppardmoves.com. There you can uh, join my community. You can purchase the book. You can learn more about my one-to-one uh, -one work with women. Uh, so everything is there. You can also connect with me on social, um, Lily Shepherd Moves on Instagram and Facebook and Lily Shepherd on LinkedIn. I'm in all the places. I try You're to be in all, all the places. places. Okay. Yes. But I love to, I love to connect and, and hear the stories of fellow driven women who are working through this life and trying to, yeah. to find joy and pleasure and, and embody it. So I, I would yeah. love to hear from you. Awesome. Yes. And thank you for your work on behalf of driven women. Like we definitely need something like this. I mean, what you said earlier is so true. Like nobody tells us these things you're the only person I've ever met that is doing this kind of work, maybe because I'm not in that world. But I mean, I think it's somewhat rare. Um, it's definitely not in the circles that I'm in where, you know, people are talking about this. And so um, on behalf of all driven women, we thank you and we appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me, Holly. This yes. was so much fun. This was fun. Thanks for being here. So I still have more to say. And I think it's only fitting on Valentine's Day that my closing remarks are regarding love. And I think my biggest takeaway, not only from that conversation with Lily just now, but also almost 20 years as a divorce lawyer and my own personal life experiences is love, the best love really starts with yourself, not just loving yourself, but also really being complete by yourself, within yourself, and then once you're a whole person on the inside and once you're complete within yourself, then and only then can you bring in somebody else who compliments you. But that person can never be the thing that completes you. You really have to be that all on your own. And once you bring in that person that compliments you, I think that is the best kind of love. And that person should help you show up as the best version of yourself and help you thrive in your life. And that's like, that's where the magic is. Two more things, like, subscribe, comment, do all the things, but also never forget you were made for more.